Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Um, so, Steve Ogadens, my name, as Leanne has mentioned, uh, you're most welcome to this session. We hope that uh, it will be. Um... Ogadas, unfortunately, we can barely hear you. Is it any better now? Uh, at that elevated pitch is, is good. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I'm saying uh, 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 welcome to the session, and uh, we hope that uh, you'll be you'll find it fruitful and uh, beneficial to you. Uh, as uh, Liana has mentioned, that uh, if you have any queries, please put them in the chat box so that uh, uh, we can be able to go through them. Uh, how we structure this is that uh, we'll uh, so I'll. I'll uh, give uh, the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves, and then uh, we get straight into the webinar. Then uh, we intend to take, uh, say, no more than uh, half an hour uh, on uh, on the discussions, and then uh, subsequently the amount of time that is left uh, will be on. Um, to address any any questions or concerns that uh, you may have um and yeah that that's how we uh, we we want to or I want to run uh with this so uh, it's an interesting topic uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, really experienced uh, panelists and uh, i think uh without further ado uh, I'll uh, let them introduce uh, themselves, and uh, I think if we go alphabetically, uh, we'll start with uh, A for Asif. Uh, Asif, please uh, tell us who you are, uh, a bit of background, at least so that uh, the, 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 the participants can uh, appreciate the weight uh, that you bring uh, to this uh, webinar. Oh, thanks. Thanks, uh, Steve. So my name is Asif. I uh, work for a private equity fund called Patisa. We invest in um, larger businesses uh, in the food value chain. Um, <clears throat> before that, I used to work for INP, which is an early stage investment fund uh, investing mostly in startups, sort of um, pre-Series A and Series A. Uh, and prior to that, I was working for an SME fund called called uh, Fanisi, which uh, uh, was investing across the the, the region. So <clears throat> I have good experience uh, in the exact stages that many of the companies uh, in the uh, in the program are uh, in today. And then hopefully, I can provide uh, some guidance on uh, you know to to help you on your fundraising journey. Thanks, Asif. Um, uh, Jason? Uh, thank you, Gada. So, uh, Jason Musioka is my name. I currently am the CFO for a health tech company that is focusing on teleradiology. That is just making it easy for hospitals and health facilities to fast track their reporting process so that patients can get healthcare as, as fast as possible. Prior to that, I was working for in the VC space for an early stage investment firm that was focusing on the Eastern African, Eastern and Central African region. And before that as well, I was also part of an angel network that was also focusing on early stage investments. So happy to be this, in this panel and also glad to say that I was part of the trained people from Investia. So if I had not been trained by Investia, it would be 1300, not 1301. But happy to be here and hopefully the conversation will provide some insights on on how someone can go about fundraising for their startups. Thank you. Good stuff. Uh, thank you, uh, Asif and Jason. Uh, I, I do hope now the, the participants uh, appreciate the depth of experience that uh, the panelists bring uh, to this session. And so please feel free to uh, put put together any questions that you may have uh, on the chat box so that uh, we can address them as we go along. Um, yeah, so I think we get uh, straight into it. So, so today we're talking about raising capital for 
a company. And uh, I think uh, 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 Asif, I'll start with you. Uh, what, uh, in terms of uh, the process, uh, the capital raising uh, process, maybe uh, you can uh, take us through uh, how an entity uh, uh, looks at uh, raising uh, capital. What 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 informs uh, the strategy? What informs uh, the, the the target? And uh, how how long would that take? Uh, and how do they ensure that uh, it is right uh, for the business? Asif. Yeah. So the i think the the first bit I, I would say the first thing to really determine is your business plan uh and you know understand where the business wants to go uh understand how you're going to get there so for example uh you know have a, a base case uh, business plan have an aggressive case uh and have a downward case um and understand exactly uh, the, the target market that you're going to be targeting, um, how you're going to run your operations, why uh, you're the business to win. Um, you know, so all of that, the, the company strategy must be very, very clear to you, even before you go out to, to raise any money. Um, <clears throat> and the main reason for that is many startups don't, uh, you know, when they're raising money, they don't really understand or haven't dug deep enough to be able to explain to an investor in in very simple terms why they are the ones money versus all the others that are, are in the market. Uh, because it, whatever business you you're running today, whatever innovation you have, uh, other businesses, there, there are competitors who have, if not exactly the same idea or the same product or the same service uh, but something similar um, so so there, there are competitors in the market that are uh, geared towards what you're doing and therefore you have to be very clear in terms of your strategy and your unique selling proposition um, <clears throat> then once you have that understood uh, the next thing is how much money you need uh, and the kind of investor that you want um, because many businesses make mistakes in in getting money in that uh, perhaps is not the right type of money for them. <clears throat> Either it's uh, money that's going to push them in the wrong direction or it's uh, the, the strategy doesn't fit uh, or the culture doesn't fit. Um, so you have to understand the, the amount of money you need and the kind of money you need and the structures that you want. Is it debt? Uh, is it equity? Is it something in between? Um, <clears throat> and then in, in terms of and, and how much money you raise also depends on, on the plan that you're going to have. Uh, but we generally these days advise people to have a buffer. Um, so a 12-month buffer, and, and, and you know, I'm sure Jason can, can give a view on this as well, but a 12-month buffer is something that you really need because if, if you think you're going to need $500,000, you'll probably need two hundred and fifty. dollars or 300,000 extra to survive uh, one, either a difficult fundraising period, number one, or uh, you probably undercalled the, co the costs that are, that are going to hit your company in, in certain times. Um, so if you undercall the cost, you need uh, a bit of a buffer. So you need to put that as well. That, that's also part of the understanding of how much money you need. Um, and then in terms of timing, uh, it's taking a lot longer to raise capital um, now compared to two years ago. Um, so I, I would give it, whereas before I would have given it uh, three to four months, uh, sometimes even shorter. Now you're talking about six to nine months, uh, you know, to, to go through the entire cycle. And, and I, I suppose, um, you know, my, my colleagues on the on the panel can also give a view on that, but that's that's what we're seeing at the moment. Thanks, thanks, Asif. And uh, so you mentioned um, having a business plan, uh, uh, having a strategy of various uh, instruments, debt, equity, MES, 
And uh, so what, in your experience, uh, having been in the space, to what extent have you yeah, seen um uh, have you seen the entrepreneurs or uh, or uh, the business promoters have a grasp have a grasp of um of um uh of, of, of the financial aspects around uh, fundraising uh, because so more often than not uh, you find vision bearers uh, they know the technical aspects uh, of the business or what they want to achieve uh, or the advantage of this, the the problem they're looking to solve, but they not they may not necessarily have the uh, be strong on the financial uh, aspects of of uh, of the business. Uh, see, yeah. So we normally recommend when looking at businesses, especially in this earlier stages, uh, whether it's startups, you know, t tech startups or non-tech startups or SMEs is to advise them to get the right, uh, advise them to get the right corporate finance advisor, the right lawyer who really understands agreements. Um, but the, in terms of the corporate finance advisor to really guide them through the process and what is needed and why they're giving certain information. Um, and especially when it comes to the kind of instruments because for us as an investor, this is an everyday, this, this is our job. But for the startup, they're not raising capital every, every day. So the, the, they do need some hand-holding in guiding them to the right kind of investor, to the right instrument. Um, otherwise, what you find at the end is uh, the entrepreneurs or the startups, uh, management teams regret uh, raising a certain type of, uh, you know, certain amount of money from certain investors. And you don't want that because that's when the relationship breaks. So g getting that is, is important. And I think um, the other bit is not being in a hurry to raise. And the only way uh, that you can move away from being uh, desperate to raise is to start early um, and to also speak to people who've done this before. So not only your corporate finance advisors, but you know somebody who's been through the journey, uh, a startup founder who's been through the journey, uh, an SME entrepreneur who's been through the journey and, and ask them of the challenges and why they raised or didn't raise and, and why they went down a certain route. And that sort of gives you an idea of, of why you should you know give a view of why uh, you, you're going down a particular route. And I, and I think, I can't stress this enough, is that you, uh, you you want to raise money to grow your business, but the more desperate you are, uh, the more investors are going to shy away from it. Um, so m money follows money. Um, so if, if, if you show that the business is actually making money, always going to make money in the future, and there's a credible plan, the more likely that uh, you get a credible investor to put money into your business. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks, Asif. Uh, just on, uh, and uh, just picking up from uh, what uh, Asif has mentioned around uh, some uh, mistakes uh, entrepreneurs make or startups make uh, when fundraising. Uh, I think it will be good uh, or beneficial to the participants here just for you to share in your experience um, what kind of uh, uh, mistakes uh, you've seen uh, uh, startups making in the fundraising uh, process, uh, whether it's uh, the sizing, whether it's uh, the instrument, whether it's uh, um, the, the, the 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 partner or or or, or the target uh, uh, funder. Jason? Yeah, absolutely. So. I think the most important thing just to to touch on what also Asifa said is planning for the fundraise and planning for it very early on so that at least you have your list of target investors and you have your documentation ready so that when the time comes, because fundraising does take a bit, does distract you a bit from, you know, day-to-day -day operations. 
and you will be surprised that it's as much as you plan for it, also you find yourself trying to balance running normal operations, but also trying to balance engaging and taking time to speak to investors and respond to their questions and inquiries. So always be, always plan ahead. And I think the best way you can plan ahead is just to get some advice on what will be necessary for you to engage in a fundraising process. So the documentations that you need, the kind of advice that you need, and more importantly, also the target investors that you should be speaking to. Because you only want to be speaking to investors that might come later on in, the, in your company, and then you're speaking to them too early. It will be a waste of time, really. So you want to also make sure that you're speaking to the right investors that could potentially look at this company from an investment interest. And in that way, it also brings efficiency into the whole fundraising process. So I think that planning element is what is important. And I, and also from just having been in the operating side, I think it's something that can be done and can be improved upon a lot more. So that is one. And the second part is just also on the investor side that also see had touched on it, that you misalignment with investors can cause a lot of trouble if at the depending on the stage of your business and also depending on what you're really looking for for your company, it could be grant funding or debt or whatever it is or whatever instrument that you're seeking. It would be good just to make sure that you get the right investors on board and because those investors will be able to drive the strategy that Asif was talking about. So there's no misalignment of strategy and then all of you are pushing the cart in the same direction. So that investor identification and making sure that you speak to the right people that can help your business go to the next stage before you think of either going back to the market to fundraise will be very important and useful and will save you a lot of time and headache as, as you plan on your fundraising process and journey. Yeah, um, thanks, Jason. You talk about the right investors. And so where do you get, I mean, for a startup, where where do they find the this right investors and and how do they shout uh, them? The best way, I think the most introductions work best. So if you have previous investors that have already invested in the company, then you can ask them if they know other investors that would be willing to participate in this particular round. But if you haven't done that, then I guess you can also just go do Google search to see investors in your certain in your sector or industry and in your stage or in your geography that will be interested in talking to you from an investment perspective when you're when you're fundraising. So that also might help, but I think networking as well is very important. And as as much as people don't might be shy away of not like the, the networking aspect of it, it will also be very important that you try to figure out where do these investors normally tend to hang around or where which events do they go to or where can you find them so that at least you can be able to go and engage them and tell them a bit about your business there. And I think another aspect outside of just as much as Asifa talked about it in terms of talking to founders about their fundraising journey and process. Also ask other, found, other founders that might be in your sector as well, where, which kind of investors do invest in companies like yours at the stage of career. So just speaking to other in founders out there in the market because it's, it's, it's a collaborative effort. And the more you speak to people, the more you ask them, hey, you're trying to fundraise, who can I speak to? Then they can really give you names and potentially of potential investors that you can talk to so that at least you can speak to them and tell them about your idea and the business what you're doing and see if you can get a conversation investment conversation going on okay um yeah thanks uh, jason or maybe just word uh, that uh, they can also reach out to invest in africa limited which then uh, uh, yeah. interacts quite a lot with the uh, investors and uh, get guidance from there. Now, uh, and to, uh, to uh, move back to uh, Asif, and uh, Asif, I just want to understand from you, uh, in terms of pitching uh, to investors, what what, what uh, should be uh, included in a pitch deck? What are we saying? What are the buzz words? Um, or the key, how, how do you, how, how does a, a business 
or a startup then uh, position itself uh, to make for an attractive investment uh, what are the what should what do investors want to see uh, in 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 uh, in a pitch uh, in a pitch deck yeah so so i think that that the the the, the shortest answer to that is it depends um because different investors require or look at investments uh, in their own particular ways so you'll have investors that are more conservative and want you know in quotes more realistic view of the business and what it can achieve uh, and maybe are pessimistic about you know the heavy high growth uh, you know kind of startup um, and the others that want to be sold a dream uh, which is achievable right so both of them i mean either of those investors will have their vision or their view of what a pitch deck should look like um so if if you send a conservative uh, uh, investor you know a pitch deck showing a 10x uh, or 20x growth they will tell you well how's how's that going to be achieved um and again that kind of investor will look for more uh, downside protection so there will be more conservative they're more likely to put in a convertible instrument which gives them some coupon uh, if in case the business doesn't do well and maybe you know something like a liquidity preference uh, if the business doesn't do well whereas a more aggressive investor uh, you know might not focus that much on the downside protection but really wants to understand uh, how this thing is going to uh, 20x its growth um <clears throat> so d- depending on that you then tailor the the pitch deck but if you look at what is generally required in a pitch deck so first of all an understanding of what the company does and why it's doing what it's doing and why it's unique uh, number one and then number two uh, why the management team is the right one to to be successful in that operation uh, and the experience um, and 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 what the gaps might be if there's gaps uh, you know maybe call them out um so that investors know that uh, you understand uh where your gaps are and perhaps part of the money that you're going to be raising is to fill those management gaps as well uh and then number 3 you know uh, where the business is going to go and this is where uh, I'm saying you know it depends on on investor to investor so it depends on who you're raising from so is that an angel investor you're raising from or angel investors or is it you're raising from family offices or you're raising from sme funds or you're raising from pure play vc funds uh, are you raising from impact funds all of these will have their view of where the business can go um <clears throat> and then number four the instrument that you're going to be raising the amount of money that you need uh and the kind of instrument that you you're suggesting and the kind of valuation uh, if it's a priced round then the kind of valuation that uh, you're raising based on um and then the fifth one i suppose uh, and then this is it, it comes as part of uh you know the uh the first bit of, of your unique selling point is where you are uh versus your com- competition um so entrepreneurs and startups tend to um perhaps in a graph where you have uh your startup startup a versus your competition uh many startups tend to show themselves as overly unique which is great um but maybe doesn't show the reality so uh if you show an overly rosy picture that also puts investors off because they, they don't investors know uh, you know they see uh, i think a good investor generally sees uh five you know uh pitch decks a week um or more than that sometimes uh from from various angles some that just will never fly uh, and some that they might take forward but you see a lot of pitch decks and and you don't want to you 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 don't want to show the investor that you don't know your market so you must also call out the reality 
Um, so I would say that that's where those are the kind of things that you want to put in a pitch deck. Oh, thanks, um, Asif, for that. And, uh, now that you talk about uh, the different uh, the different types of investors, uh, I mean, if you just give an example, what do you think, say, an angel in investor would like to see vis-a-vis, -vis, say, what um, a more established investor? Uh, would like to see. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so angel investors and, and the angel networks and angel investors are still nascent in this market. Um, many of us have, have tried uh, putting some money in startups. You know, some have done okay, some haven't. Um, so there's learnings from that. So there's a continuous learning that comes out of making investments and what is true today might not be true in a year from now. Uh, but generally, angel investors, because it's their own money they're putting in, they tend to be more risk averse. Um, so they want to really see how they're going to get the money back. Um, they're comparing the return that they're going to get from startups to uh, what they will get from real estate, what they will get from um, bonds uh, and fixed deposits and things like that. So they, they, they tend to be a bit more wary. Uh, however, these are small amounts of money as well. So the, the angel investors are also sometimes not necessarily investing for a pure return, but are investing to learn, are investing to build networks. Or, um, uh, so what they, what they really want is to be able to see how they're going to get the money back and they're comparing it. Uh, to other investments that they could make with that money. The, the VC funds are looking for this one deal, uh, and, and every deal must make that criteria. They're looking for the deal that actually is going to 10x or 20x their growth is going to make their fund. And they, remember, they have deeper pockets, so they have, they're looking for an investment that maybe they can invest $500,000 today or a million dollars today or $2 million. But they should be able to see that this business is going to grow big enough for them to invest in later rounds, so follow-on capital. So angel investors don't generally look for follow-on capital, maybe a bit. Um, so if they invest 5000 maybe they have another 5000 stashed away to follow on. But VC funds, uh, you know, they will follow on in successful businesses and they want to see how you know your 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 growth strategy is to get them to that uh, and generally have a bit more patient capital so they are going to be willing to stay on for 5 years uh, for 6 7 uh, years and sometimes more angel investors mm -hmm. will want to get out uh, at almost the first opportunity that somebody is going to offer them so if the first opportunity comes three years from today for them to exit, it might not provide them a fantastic return, but the fact that there's some liquidity, uh, they'll be in the, they, they can get out, that, that is quite enticing to them. So, so the, two th the two kind of investors look at things differently. Um, but what I will say is the angel mindset is still developing. Um, so what, what might be true today is not necessarily true, you know, it's not necessarily going to be true a year, two years from now. Um, but but I guess J Jason can give a view on this as well. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Asif. Um, Jason, um, yeah, I, I think you'd, uh, you can feel free to just give uh, an overview of the same. Then I want, want to bring you uh, in on the discussion around valuation, but please let's chime in on this uh, first. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, no, I like the way Asif has really put the distinction between angels and VCs. <clears throat> Quite frankly, I think I don't have much to add on that. So, yeah, it's like you said, in different horizons, different perspectives. Patient capital versus more risk averse capital. So I think what I see for saying is pretty much spot on. Okay. Um, thanks, Jason. Uh, let's talk about uh, valuation. 
uh, and so just some if you can just give us your thoughts and experience around the valuation of uh, a startup uh, what are the key financial metrics uh, that investors would like to see uh, and also in terms of uh, projections how then uh, are uh, projections um, uh, validated especially considering that uh, it is a startup uh, there's no historicals that you can gauge uh, that can use to gauge uh, uh, the potential performance of the business how do you ensure that uh, these uh, projections make sense or the assumptions uh, behind them make sense how do you uh, test uh, the valuation to actually realize that uh, uh, that it's uh, it's not just creating numbers in the air jason yeah so i think the subject of valuation has been uh, quite an issue especially now that given the different cycles that the funding landscape has gone through <clears throat> and whereby we used to have a lot of crazy valuations previously and it was more about selling the story than trying to give or validate you know basically basing your valuation assumptions on realistic metrics so that has changed a bit and i think it's a good thing that it has changed because now most of the time investors are really looking at realistic numbers that make sense given the macroeconomic context and more importantly given the performance of the business or even the market assumptions that you have as a business to in the specific industry that you're working so there are very many ways in which you can undertake a valuation exercise as a business and i'm sure the private equity investors differ from vc investors in how they look at the valuation the, the, the dynamic whereby you find vcs are more looking at profitability a bit a bit a, a bit of positive businesses etc while we see given the fact that they are trying to look at the companies that can make exponential growth we look at more other and look at more revenue metrics that might not be the same as what the PE, the PE investors are looking at. And also angels also look at different metrics when they're looking at the valuation. But also the angels, not necessarily too much of valuation because they look at it from uh, the investment amount and the investment size perspective. So I would say the way we can look at, at least for from our perspective, the way we look at it is that we try to see we balance between what you expect our strategy to yield versus basing it on how the business and the company has been performing for the previous previous years so once you take a good assumption that and the view of that then you can then you can then project uh, like make an assumption of how the business is likely to perform in the next couple of years and of course these are these are things that you can stress this over time and that is why getting a corporate finance advisor like Investia to help you come up with a model that gives you a good assumption of how the of, of the assumptions that you're basing the growth of the business on can really can be validated month one and also can be logic and defended by when you start speaking to investors and especially when you start speaking to investors it will be important for them also to see the sense and the logic behind the assumptions that you're making and something else also that is also important is that people need to distinguish between how a business values the company and also what is the likely price the investors can is going to buy the company for or is going to invest that so it's it's a negotiation whereby you come to a fair value whereby these what you expected in terms of going to the market with and then also there's what the investors will push back and ask to to price the company at so it's a negotiation and that's why i think it's a technical uh, technical advices like investors can come in and also just support the business in terms of just to get in the negotiations done and making sure that both parties can see and have a good understanding of the basis of the value and the pricing of the business at that particular point. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Jason. Um, I haven't seen any uh, uh, 
queries or comments in the, the chat box. Uh, uh, we are we are almost getting into the Q and A session, so please uh, put them together so that uh, we can be able to address them as we go along. Um, so uh, again, please be on the lookout uh, for that. Uh, and as that happens, we can then. Uh, oh, Gada, oh, sorry, your audio um is we're not able to hear you properly. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that I haven't seen any uh, questions uh, posted, so I, I don't know, Leanne, if you've seen any, because uh, I, I, I was saying that we are almost getting into the Q&A session, so we'd like to deal with them at that point in time. All right, uh, so far no questions, but we can continue. I'm sure they'll take, all right. We have, we have one from Jose. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, then uh, I think uh, the few of the questions, uh, I think uh, the message is that uh, the information is so satisfactory that uh, uh, th there's nothing that is unclear. But uh, that said, uh, I'm, I see them now coming through. Uh, but let's just uh, finish maybe in the next uh, four minutes, then uh, uh, we get to address uh, the questions. Now, uh, back to yourself. Um, uh, talking about uh, uh, legal uh, and compliance considerations. And uh, yes, I know this is not a legal uh, uh, discussion, but again, in your experience, uh, what are the legal documents uh, and agreements uh, that are, uh, are utilized in a fundraising process? Uh, that's one. And then secondly, in terms of uh, DT, uh, and I think we can restrict it to financial uh, DD. What uh, uh, what 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 should uh, uh, startups uh, uh, prepare for with respect to DD, or how how can they be ready or due diligence ready? I said. Yeah. So, <clears throat> in terms of legal, so the. It depends on the agreement uh, or the structure that you're going to use. Uh, but normally, um, if it's a convertible, then you'll have uh, you know, a convertible debt instrument and something guiding how that's going to be converted. So all of the terms, that's you know, how it's going to be converted to equity, if it's going to be converted. If it's debt, then it's a debt structure um, uh, agreement. Um, and it also depends on the jurisdiction that you your startup is based in. So, and, and, and what law you're using as well. So um, some are using English and, and Wales, uh, you know, legal jurisdictions, some is Mauritius. A lot of startups is Delaware. So it could be based on uh, Delaware legal structures. Um, there's some that are Netherlands. So all of these have, have different, um, uh, requirements um, and therefore you should get a lawyer uh, who is used to uh, you know VC uh, agreements you know so uh, who understands if it's a safe you know uh, simple agreement for for future equity or that kind of uh, agreement or some some variation of that agreement then they they, they have experience in in, in that um, so that they're not misadvising you, uh, because it can be scary. Some of these agreements are are fairly scary, but they're standard, um, and therefore, you know, VC funds are not going to have that much uh, ability to move away some of the from some of the terms. So certain rights, drag rights, and things like that are going to be quite standard. Um, so those are from the legal side. Uh, make sure you know what you're signing. <clears throat> from the financial due diligence side. Uh, so this has increased over the last uh, year, couple of years. Previous to that, so if you were talking, if, if you're raising money in 2018, 2019, 20 and 21, around that time, uh, the amount of financial due diligence being done by, by funds was fairly limited, um, by VC funds anyway, it was fairly limited uh, because of the speed that uh, that was needed uh, and, and the market at the time. Um, today, I would say there's a lot 
of financial ED that's required. So even if you don't have um, previous uh, audited accounts, they will look into uh, trading figures, they will look into uh, management accounts, they will look at your plans going forward, uh, they will look at the ability to achieve those plans uh, by the company, they will look into um, you know, route to profitability. Uh, they will also <clears throat> try and understand uh, and compare the business's GP margins uh, to peer GP margins because they're seeing this on a, you know, uh, they're seeing similar businesses on a regular basis. So, so all of that. So w what I would say is uh, there's quite a bit of depth these days that funds are getting into um, and uh, startups should be ready to open themselves up to quite a bit of scrutiny. Okay. Uh, thanks, Asif. Uh, I'm seeing that it's uh, 10 minutes uh, to the hour, and um, I've seen some questions uh, already started coming in. Uh, the first one is from Auma, uh, uh, and it was like, if I, had, if I had correctly, Asif mentioned that entrepreneurs should be cautious of bad money. Do you mind uh, elaborating more on that, Asi? Yeah. So when I when I say bad money, it's not necessarily what we're not talking about is, is fraudulent investors. You, you would hardly find that. Uh, you may, but with the, with the kind of uh, um, limited partners behind them, so you have all of the DFIs behind them um, <clears throat> and large family offices. They've done their due diligence on the people running the funds, uh, so you don't expect a fraudulent investor. But when I when I talk about bad money, what that means is uh, an investor who's not aligned with your growth, with your growth plan. So um, if you want to take your business in a particular direction, you should be the driver while the uh, or the pilot uh, while. Uh, the fund is the co-pilot. So the fund is helping you to navigate uh, while you, you're in the, in, in the, captain's, the captain's seat. Um, and where you see a mismatch there is that sometimes a fund wants the business to go into, in a particular direction. And, you know, you as an entrepreneur understand that you want, you know, you have a mission, you have a vision, and this is the direction you want to go. And where there's a mismatch, there's, there's always going to be a, a, a conflict. Uh, and, and many a times you will know that conflict and so, from before. And sometimes entrepreneurs in their desperation to raise money because they can see that you're going down a waterfall, uh, in the desperation to raise money uh, will bring in an investor that's not completely aligned with them. And, and that's and they know they have a gut feeling that this is probably not going to be the right match, but they'll still do it because they need to raise the money, and that's always a bad start. Um, so make sure that um, you're able to raise money from the right investor who is aligned, and also be able to get guidance because you 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 know you you know where the business wants to go, but you don't know how necessarily to get there. So. Uh, or you know how to get there, but you can add, you know, the investor is uh, able to add from their experience quite a bit of value to you. Make sure that you you are able to absorb that, uh, that advice, but there must be alignment. And the way, the best way that I generally put it is um, <clears throat> you should be so comfortable with the alignment uh, and with the culture and with the investor uh, that if you were to leave, be able to leave, if you have kids, if you're able to leave your kids with them, then that's the right uh, match uh, because that's your most priced possession. So if you can get to that level of alignment and that level of uh, understanding, then that's probably the right investor for you. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks, Asif. Uh, uh, Jason, uh, coming back to you on the second query. Uh, what would you advise, this is from Simon already, what would you advise a pre-revenue company on the steps they need to take uh, to raise their first round? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So, 
I mean, of course, the the challenge of that is, I would say, if you can go for a non-price round because you don't have revenue where you can use to realistically price yourself, I would suggest that you go for a non-price round. Or if you can get any sort of equity free investment instrument like a grant funding or a technical support facility that enables you at least to get to a point whereby you can realistically measure, get some bit of revenue so that at least if there is need for additional capital, then you can use that as a as a premise to 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 raise to raise VC or or other external capital using a price from a price perspective. So I would say if you have free revenue, I will go for instruments that do not necessarily need any pricing around it. Could be safe notes, could be uh, grant facilities, or any sort of technical support facilities that can help you get to a point where you can realistically get some bit of traction, and then using that traction, you can use it as as a measure for what you expect, the, what the value of the company can post potentially be. So that's it. But if that is not possible, I will say. Uh, there are certain methodologies that I think we can either adopt that could be useful that either you can come up with some valuation methodologies that can help you estimate the probability or the the way you, you can, you're going to generate revenue and of course those assumptions will still need to be tested at the point of you generate in revenue and you can keep on adjusting those assumptions as you generate revenue. And then using those methodologies, I think like the discounted cash flow methodology, you can use that to just at least get an, an idea of where you think the business is likely to be should certain assumptions come to be true. And then of course you can keep on adjusting that that valuation, you can keep on adjusting that those assumptions as you generate revenue as you keep on growing your business. But also you also need to talk to the investor and really just be honest about it that at the point where you're raising capital, you don't have enough, you don't have revenue as a basis to estimate the value of the business. So just have an honest conversation and then you can agree on what are the things that you're likely to put in place so that at least you can come to a fair assumption of of pricing and also a fair assumption of what or how you can adjust the pricing if certain things come out, become true or don't come true. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks Jason. Um, the, the next one is from Mary Kamau. Not a question, not a comment. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a question rather about uh, uh, in reaching out to investors, can you assist us with a pool of investors who can reach out to in the agri space? Uh, Mary, please uh, refer that to uh, refer that to investia. Uh, we can have a discussion on that. Uh, then Kelvin Bubwa asks, uh, what resources or tools do you recommend for startups looking to enhance uh, their fundraising efforts? Uh, uh, this one, I think, this one we'd like to uh, get into. Sorry, Ogada, uh, we can barely hear you. Oh, so, uh, sorry, I was, I was saying that um, uh, for Kel uh, Kelvin Bugwa had a question around uh, the resources or tools uh, that uh, are recommended for startups looking to enhance uh, their fundraising efforts. Uh, Jason? You're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Before Leanne says she can't hear me. Um, <laughs> what else? I think I just go back to the idea of expanding your resources or channels, basically of identifying and sourcing investors. And because other tools could be also uh, published data on the investment landscape in Africa. I think there are several publications that try to narrow down on stage, sector, investment size, focus area, region, et cetera, et cetera. So if you can also go to sources like those, like I think it's Big Deal or 
something and then there's a couple of them like brighter brighter bridge brighter bridges or something that and other sort of publications like those ones that can help you figure out or map out they've already mapped out the ecosystem for you that can help you narrow down into the sort of investors that you want but i'll still go back to the traditional route of networking looking for introductions and just speaking to companies like investor to which engage a lot of investors to put you in touch with them or just to help you and support your fundraising process okay uh thanks jason i see we are the top of the hour let's just take this one last uh, question and let's see if this would be yours before we hand over back to Lian. Uh, and uh, this is from Adelaide and Adelaide uh, is saying that there have been discussions about the funding winter. Uh, in your opinion, do you think this challenging period for fundraising is coming to an end? And will the post winter be any different from the pre winter? And how, sh how should the founders adapt their fundraising strategies to navigate in this to navigate this new investment uh, landscape? Asif? <clears throat> yeah, so I'll maybe be a bit controversial here and say that what looks like a funding winter is how the investment landscape is in fact supposed to be in this environment, uh, which is risky, uh, which doesn't have the kind of, you know, where uh doing a running a business uh running startups is a very very difficult thing to do uh the markets are not uh, homogenous across the you know the the, the various regions so if you're going to expand from kenya to uganda to tanzania to wherever else uh each of these markets are different the culture you know there's cultural norms that are different there's the way people spend uh, money is different, what they spend on, all of that. Um, <clears throat> what we saw pre-winter, what we're calling winter, uh, is that startups were um, promising certain growth metrics uh, to investors and investors also were believing these growth metrics without having, without the realization that if you're gonna grow into all these different markets, uh, and you're not yet a profitable business, every market you go into, you're building another startup in that market um, and it, regulation, etc. So <clears throat> what that meant is that many startups were raising money, but, uh, you know, they were not hitting their plans. Uh, investors had to pour more money into it um, and at higher and higher and higher valuations. Uh, and nobody was willing to give down rounds, for example, because startups didn't want down rounds, obviously. Investors didn't want to give down rounds uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, so valuations kept on going up. Um, and, and all of that was pretty unhealthy. And we took this whole model from the US, or, you know, developed markets, and, and without really adapting it, you know, uh, Put it into our environment and it doesn't work so uh, i would be while it hurts it's 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 very painful and even for us investors it is um to say that maybe this is how the reality is actually supposed to be and therefore my projection of it is that this uh, in quotes winter is not going away anytime soon this is the new reality until the point where you have this euphoria returning um, so there's always a cycle. So even if you if you look at the boom and bust periods, or you know, in, in economic cycles, there's there's a ten, maybe now shorter, but say eight to ten year, you know, boom bust cycle, and and we see that also in in the investing space. So at some point, um, that euphoria will come back, and great great for startups that are raising at that point. But for now, I would say in the next you know three years at least you can't forecast more than that but i would say two to three years uh i would expect this environment to remain uh, more or less the way it is and the businesses that are going to be funded are those that actually have a proper business plan and a believable plan to actually turn the business profitable and grow 
sustainably uh, and sustainably doesn't mean 5%, 10% growth per year, that's actually too low for a startup. It, it can be doubling every year, every couple of years, but you know, believable uh, growth and not going into markets just blindly. Uh, so sustainable for me means some form of realism that's, uh, you know, it's your business is grounded, the plan is grounded in something. Um, so yeah, the, I would say it's not, uh, you know, th this is what I, I, I suspect the next two, three years is still going to be like. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Asif. I think uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you uh, for such an, uh, an, in, an interesting conversation, uh, uh, thought provoking. And, uh, Gada. Yes. We can can't hear. Yes. Oh, dear. Uh, is it any better now? Much better. Great, great. You know, so I was saying, I was uh, just expressing gratitude to my panelists for an interesting conversation uh, that was thought provoking. And uh, I believe that uh, the audience have uh, gained valuable insights into this discussion around fundraising. And I'm hoping that uh, uh, it will help them, uh, especially for the entrepreneurs or the business promoters or the startup uh, founders. Uh, to be able to then apply towards uh, their fundraising process. And uh, I do hope that uh, uh, they can be able then to, to benefit from uh, this discussion. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Leanne, I'll hand over back to you uh, for closing. And uh, we do apologize for crossing over the mark by now six minutes, but uh, I'm hoping it was worth the while, Leanne. So thank you everyone for making time for today's uh, webinar. Uh, stay tuned to for the next ones, and we'll also share this uh, recording uh, to be on email. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you for inviting. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.